difficult, frustrating, intimidating. These are words that flash through the average gamer's mind when they hear the name from software. Since the release of Dark Souls in 2011, from Software have quickly made themselves a household name. Known for producing games with unforgiving difficulty and just as cryptic stories, these games are equal parts revered and feared. From the outside looking in, they seem to have a Midas touch, every game as of late becoming an instant classic, and at worst, receiving Game of the Year. But why do their fans keep coming back? eager for punishment, time and time again. Is dying over and over really all that fun? Founded in 1986, but producing their first game in 1994, From Software has persevered and overcome. Building trust within a small community, their tireless effort has blossomed into the recognition they have always deserved, but were never given. Nowadays, From Software is more popular than ever, a titan with eyes the world over glued to their every move. But this wasn't always the case. With the return of their once popular Armor Core franchise, I thought a look back was in order for those who only just joined us, or perhaps those yet interested. So humor me a little, and join me in this expansive celebration of everything From Software where we will see what's changed and how much has stayed the same. There's more to this company than crushing difficulty. Prepare to die. And by that I mean myself. I must have lost my mind. In this video series, we'll offer an in-depth look at every game from software has ever developed. Developed being the key word. I will not be covering games they only published like the Tenchu series, which while a shame, as I really enjoy Tenchu, this will be long enough as is. Of course, here is a preemptive spoiler warning. I will cover a game's development, explain the premise, and cover gameplay first, moving on to the real meat of the story after. If a game interests you and you wish to experience it firsthand, then simply skip to the next game. But if you're someone who will never touch an old game, regardless of any attempts on my behalf, then the long story spoilers are for you. We don't really need any more armchair experts in this sphere, but on the off chance that something sparks even the tiniest bit of interest in these old games, then it was worth it in the end. Probably. From software games typically focus more on gameplay and feature a light-handed, classic touch when it comes to writing story. So there isn't always much to spoil, but in my opinion, knowing everything right off the bat ruins the experience, so consider yourself warned. Wanting to distance themselves from being known only as the developers of Kingsfield, the time was right to revisit Zam's K3. With Yasuyoshi Karasawa heading the project, and after revision upon revision of the original concept, From Software finally made their third-person mecha shooter a reality. The dungeon crawling was removed. Instead, they opted for an arcade-style mission system. This allowed less resources to be spent on making a large interconnected world, and more time on refining the combat and mecha design. To make their game the best it could be, From Software reached out to many professional mecha designers, finally reaching a close rapport with Shoji Kawamori. This was a big deal for the project, as Kawamori was famed for being the creator of not only Macross, but Escaflone and Transformers. Before meeting from software, though not a gamer himself, Kawamori had heard stories from friends. To many, from software had the reputation of being a company 
that designed hardcore games for maniacs. Being active in the anime industry, Kalamori was accustomed to the streamlined, orderly process in which animation was created. So upon meeting with From Software, he was surprised with how organized and efficient their process was, and with their focus on always pushing the limits of what the PlayStation could handle. And the graphics and the tech demo left quite an impression on him. So with Kawamori on board, the next step was reaching an agreement on the core philosophy of the designs. Both sides agreed that realism was the way to go for a next-gen action game. But when the idea of allowing players to customize their mecha was injected into the conversation, things got complicated. Karasawa came up with the idea of swapping out extra parts, while Kawamori created the concept of cores, the central heart of the mecha, upon which these extra parts could be added and mixed about. Thus, the project was named Armored Core. This concept gave Kawamori an easier time designing how these customizable mecha would fit together, while retaining a central design aesthetic. To avoid the player's custom mechs, looking like randomly jumbled parts. Now I'm sure this wasn't the programmer's idea, as the game was squeezing everything it could out of the PlayStation to run as it was, but someone at the company still wanted to make the multiplayer aspect of Zam's K3 a reality. Probably Natoshi Jin. I know that multiplayer was a big feature in shooters of the day, and the public's need for a mecha multiplayer game was high, but the 1997 PS1 wasn't the venue for making this a possibility. Nothing had changed since the attempts to port Zams to the PS1 in 1994. So to fulfill the multiplayer functionality, Armored Core became one of the few PlayStation titles to utilize the link cable, allowing two players on two separate PlayStations on two televisions to test the capabilities of their machines in arena combat. Despite Kurosawa mentioning in an interview that it was impossible due to the strain it created, somewhere during development, a split-screen feature was added, the result of someone's tireless efforts sleeping at the office, no doubt. And there was such a focus on the multiplayer that the demo consisted entirely of this game mode. The advertising surrounding the multiplayer got to the point that Kurosawa was worried that players would expect the game to be a versus combat game, and not a mission-based single-player experience. Regardless, on July 10th, 1997, just a year after the release of Kingsfield 3, the first entry in the storied Armored Core franchise hit shelves in Japan. In the wake of the last war, known as the Great Destruction, the Earth has become a radioactive dust bowl. A plan was put forward by a coalition of companies to abandon the inhospitable surface and move humanity underground. This plan, termed the Centennial Plan, would see society once again flourishing in a vast underground network of city complexes within a hundred years. The first city, Isaac City, was constructed, and many more were built using its model. But fifty years have passed since the Great Destruction, and mankind is no closer to a utopia. Using the Centennial Plan as a means to farther their own interests, the corporations rule. To aid in the construction efforts, research was focused on the improvement of robotics. Thus, the Muscle Tracer, or MT, was created. Within a short time, advancements in MT design led to the creation of the Core, a robotic chassis that allowed swapping in and out parts as circumstances called for it. Aptly named Core MTs, or CMTs for short. Though originally designed for manual labor, the MT was quickly co-opted by the corporations and used as yet another means of control. Now humanity survivors are caught between the corporate warfare of two conglomerates. Chrome, the original advocate for the Centennial Plan, and the industrial manufacturer, Murakumo Millennium. 
both will stop at nothing to eliminate the competition, no matter the cost. This is where you come into the picture. Back during the implementation of the Centennial Plan, the military organization, Raven's Nest, was formed to correct anything that interfered with progress. Though once operated by Chrome, the Raven's Nest is now an autonomous entity. Renowned as a famed mercenary contractor, the Raven's Nest is a top provider of CMTs for hire. Specifically, heavily modified variants, colloquially known by the public as Armored Cores. These mercs are known as Ravens. Some are regarded as heroes, but most are just your typical soldiers of fortune. A Raven takes no sides. Free from trivial matters like ethics or morality, no matter the mission, if you have the cash, a Raven will get the job done. You are one of these mercenaries. True to their original plans for Zamsk 3, Armored Core is a fast-paced, third-person mecha experience. Depending on the skill of the player, you can make any mission look like an epic scene from your favorite mecha anime. The only thing holding you back besides skill is the camera. As Armored Core uses the same camera control system as Kingsfield, with all the same flaws. The D-pad controls your core's movement. L1 and R1 strafe side to side. L2 and R2 moves the camera up and down, while X is doing double duty as jump and boost. So the controls are simple to understand and easy to master. Nowhere near as complex as something like MechWarrior 2. Yet they afford more freedom of movement and create a higher skill ceiling. The third person has unshackled the camera somewhat, a necessity for keeping up with the breakneck speed of combat. The issue is that when you get going, high speeds are often too much for the camera to handle, and players easily lose control. Now as I said, it is possible to self-correct the flicky camera movement and deliver high octane, pristine combat footage. But once your boosters take things to the air, well, there's not much to be done if you don't have the skill. Enemies can move just as fast as the player, and certain types enjoy dashing around behind you. The major flaw in all of this is that the turning capabilities are terrible. So when facing a group of advancing robots, things work like a dream. You can strafe and boost and fly to your heart's content. But when an enemy gets behind you, expect to take two or three free shots to the back as you slowly turn around. The problem is that enemies can turn on a dime. They will dash under and over you, quickly reorienting themselves to pelt your backside. It is impossible for players to utilize this tactic without an insane level of control and almost auto-aim level of tracking. If players are feeling artistic, or just want to show off, two optional camera styles can be unlocked with cheat codes, first person, and a fixed camera. Both make the game significantly harder to play, but imagine the footage you could get with a little effort. Now I couldn't find any old camcorder footage, Armored Core 1 Mad videos, but I'm sure it's out there, taking up space in someone's parents' storage. The standout feature of Armored Core is the level of customization when building your AC. With nearly 140 parts to pick from, 60 preset color patterns, and a majority of the Mac allowing custom paint jobs, the back of the case touts that there are over 300,000 possible variations. Not even counting fine-tuning the parts themselves, players can spend hours painting their AC. Instead of just a set of pre-selected colors, from software gives players sliders to manually dial in the exact color desired. Also included is the option to create a custom emblem. Now this emblem editor is insane, allowing you to draw anything you want. The final product is entirely up to how much time you want to spend with what is essentially Microsoft Paint. Don't laugh. 
but I spent about 12 minutes making my emblem. Looks terrible, I know. But if you spend a considerable amount of time, I'm certain people out there could create something equivalent to the in-game stuff. Every armored core is made up of 10 sections. The body, or core. A head, arms, and legs. A generator. A fire control system, or FCS. Boosters. Back weapons and arm weapons. And optional parts. The trick to AC building lies in the fact that every part has stats tied to it. Of these stats, three will make or break a build. Energy points leg weight points, and core weight points. If any of these exceed the limit allotted by your parts, then your AC is unusable, as the parts are either too weak to support your heavy mech, or your generator isn't supplying enough power. Building can be a juggling act, but sometimes sacrifices will need to be made. If you desire speed, you'll need lightweight parts, but even one cannon may tip the scale too far. On the other hand, a heavily armored, armed to the teeth tank can carry anything, but will be frustratingly slow. Conscientiously designed so that no part is clearly better than the others, besides some of the weapons and internal components. Everything is clear strengths and weaknesses. It's all up to the player's tastes. You can go for style or function. Let's break down each category. There are three cores to choose from. These have different weight and armor stats, as well as slots for equipping optional parts, which we'll get to later. Anything can be built around these three, so the choice is mostly up to what matches the look you're going for. Heads have a minimal weight and armor stat. Most are just for looks, but a few have built-in radars, for pilots who don't want to sacrifice a weapon slot for one. One of the heads is just a radar antenna, for builds where you want less mech and more machine. The arms are the most useless part, as they're mostly for looks, only having weight and armor as a benefit. So this is where players are most likely to cut weight by using lighter arms. After all, any arm can hold a gun. If you want your arms to be a gun, you have that option too. Though you will be unable to equip arm weapons, you can turn your arms into machine guns, gatling guns, missile pods, cannons, plasma cannons, and even a rail gun. The legs have the greatest set of options. Light and heavy humanoid legs, reverse joint, quad legs, and caterpillar treads. Each have their pluses and minuses. The biggest hurdle here is choosing legs that can withstand the weight of everything you want. Odds are you're in need of caterpillar treads at the start. But later on, parts get lighter, and the weight limits higher. Unlike the other parts, generators are purely price equals better. So buy what you need, but don't splurge on the top gen as not only are parts added periodically throughout the game, but the best generator is hidden in a mission. A much-needed lock-on aids players in gunning down their foes, the size and range of which depends mainly on the FCS you have equipped. So it's up to personal preference, as they modify the shape or range of your auto-aim box. I don't know why someone would want some of these, but the option is there. You can be a sniper in this fast-paced boost-a-thon. Just enjoy every late-game enemy, getting in your face and barrel-stopping you. Boosters also have clearly better parts, as the more boost, the better. And the hidden part isn't any good, so choose between the two best, either max boost and big energy drain, or a similar part with about 10% less boost and 30% less drain. For weapons, you can equip one on each shoulder. These include missile pods, cannons, gatling guns, laser cannons, etc. A neat feature is that you can buy duplicates of everything if you want both shoulders to match. I don't know if it's always functional, depending on your build, but the option to prioritize aesthetics is welcome. 
A few of the top missile pods take up both shoulders regardless. Players can also equip radars. Some of the missions take place in huge sprawling maps, and having a radar to map out the area is a must for players who don't want to wander around blindly. I'm stubborn and cannot be parted from my guns, so I was one such player. It can be done, just don't pick caterpillar treads if you don't want missions taking 20 plus minutes. The arm weapons are separated into the left and right hand. The left hand can only use energy swords. If your AC has arms, there's no reason not to bring a sword, as they are an unlimited use melee attack. Very important for conserving ammo. The right hand has the option of every gun imaginable. Machine guns, bazookas, laser guns, grenade launchers, sniper rifles, flamethrowers, and even pistols. Most are underwhelming damage-wise, but these guns are for the small fry. Your shoulder weapons are your true firepower. Or you could use powerful arm weapons and weak, high ammo, shoulder weapons. It depends on what works for you. The final category are the optional parts. As the name implies, these are completely optional. Since they are some of the cheapest parts in the shop, players may find themselves purchasing one every now and again to spend their extra cash before a mission. Each part is a slot requirement, ranging from 1 to 5. The limit is purely according to what core you're running, the three of which offer 8, 12, and 16 slots, respectively. Quite a few of these are welcome upgrades to your AC. Just don't worry about using them all. The effects aren't that important to warrant ruining the integrity of your mech's design. You'll get on without them. As a raven, you need money to afford new parts for your AC, so you can take on harder missions. But when it comes time for the final payout, the cost for ammunition and repairs are deducted from your total earnings. So you can complete a mission successfully but still come out with a net loss due to maintenance costs. Energy weapons for both weapon categories do have a limit per mission, but zero cost deduction for ammunition use, as they are powered by your energy. Just something to think about. There are numerous ways to fail a mission. You could die, go out of bounds, or fail an objective. Fail enough missions and the game lets your cash go negative. To make things worse, many missions only allow one or two attempts, effectively pushing a player past the missions they were having difficulty with, to even harder missions. And without money, you are unable to upgrade, creating a cycle which guarantees the failure of a struggling player. A strange remedy for this is the Human Plus program. In World, Human Plus is an experimental procedure being pioneered by Murakumo that pushes the human body to its limit, either killing subjects or creating super soldiers in the process. When players hit a debt of negative 50,000, the Raven's Nest sells them off to be a guinea pig in Murakumo's tests. Is this the subject for our next experiment? Yes. His papers say he was a raven. Ah, so he took the usual route here. Seems to have piled up quite a debt. Must have dashed his dreams. But he will be reborn in this experiment. That is, if he lives. Hmm, you have a point there. Let's get started. For our purposes, Human Plus is an upgrade. After your first procedure, players unlock two abilities a grid-based radar that functions regardless of having a radar equipped, and when attacking with your energy swords, a well-timed tap of the X button will produce a powerful beam slash. If players continue falling into debt, there are farther upgrades. Some cannons require kneeling to fire. Well, after the fourth Human Plus experiment, players are granted the ability to use such weapons while moving or flying with all legs except the quad legs, which I think is a glitch. 
The final upgrade comes after your sixth time under the lights. Your boosting will now consume 50% less energy. It's strange to think that you can fail upwards, becoming one of the select few plus humans. But the caveat in all of this is that after every experiment, you start the entire game over from the very beginning. You keep all of your purchase gear, but still. I failed on purpose to get all the upgrades for the purposes of this video, and it is tedious doing the early missions over and over. In the end, it's more of a punishment. And besides the sword beams and not having to kneel when using certain weapons, I say avoid going into debt at all costs, as the other upgrades aren't worth the time. Oh, and your pilot name is changed to Rebel, with a set of ever-changing numbers alongside it. Annoying. And while there is a cheat to change it back, no one on the internet seemed to agree on just what the input was, so I couldn't get it to work. Just one more reason to avoid going into debt. A challenge to keep your name. At its, uh, core, Armored Core is an arcade-style shooter. True to the casual arcade in and out style, missions range from as little as 3 minutes to as long as 20 or 30, depending on if the player gets lost. With 46 missions in total, there's a large variety to challenge your skill as a raven. Though most of the missions are either destroy all enemies or locate X object, Armored Core is good at mixing things up. You will travel from the underground streets of the megacities to the barren sand-covered surface to even space. Sometimes from software goes too far with the mission diversity, creating a few not-so-fun experiences, such as any time platforming is involved. One mission in particular, where you must defend a blimp from fighter jets, is a nightmare. The jets constantly fly circles around you, making it hard to even get sights on them. But occasionally, I don't know if it's them shooting you, or them destroying another section of the blimp, but you randomly lose your footing and come tumbling off, requiring quick boosting reflexes to avoid falling and immediately failing the mission. I am happy to report that there is a mission where you must navigate a lab filled with metal corroding gas. It's the only one in the game, and there's no part that resists the poison, so players must either brute force it with heavy armor, or run a quick build to get out as fast as possible. But don't worry, all the robots in the lab are resistant, so they will happily chip down your health to reduce your survivability. When it comes to the setting, the atmosphere is classic science fiction dystopia. Playing as a mercenary, our only connection to society are the mission briefings of whoever is currently paying us. An early mission from the city guard sicks us upon a group of protesters. The guard wants them gone and doesn't want to suffer the blowback of doing it themselves, so they hire you, armed in a top-of-the-line armored core to slaughter a group of protesters in construction MTs and cranes. It's a bleak world, and you are certainly no hero. As you continue to make a reputation for yourself, you catch the eye of both Chrome and Murakumo, who begin hiring you to operate in various covert operations to undermine the other. A destroyed factory here, defending a shipment over there, the protagonist plays both sides, seemingly unbeknownst to the two conglomerates, switching teams every other mission, slowly pushing each company into a dangerous downward spiral, resulting in every mission getting more dire for humanity, as these two are backed into a corner and frantically fight for survival. An interesting feature is the Raven ranking board, to keep the competition flowing, the Raven's Nest ranks Ravens according to some vague point system, with the top 10 being a coveted and celebrated position. After all, the higher the rank, the more dangerous the missions, 
and the more cash for their completion. I will tell you now, you never meet many of these ravens. Every raven has a special pilot and AC name, an emblem, and they even had unused character designs for some reason. And there is so much mystery surrounding these individuals. So this guy, with his unimaginative naming conventions, is a ruthless cold-blooded merc, who is also a gentleman. Hmm, didn't expect him to look like that. Interesting. And this raven is known as the White Queen, and is apparently a chess master online. We don't even have a gender to go on. Well, here he is, a scruffy guy with a sword. These designs answer the question of their appearance, but open the door to so many more questions. I like it. It adds an air of realism. Realistically, no one personally eliminates every competitor to reach the top. It isn't necessary. And I doubt top spies or assassins know each other as well as they do in movies or television. Sad though, as the mystery surrounding these mercs is intriguing. Perhaps in some other universe, Armored Core was a top-selling franchise and received an anime adaptation. I'm sure it wouldn't have captured the tone, but I could see 90s merchandising doing it regardless. The soundtrack is a time capsule back to the fresh techno beats of the 90s. It's great. A real joy to listen to. The track Shape Memory Alloys, which plays in the garage, is an earworm. Good thing too, as you spend about a third of your time fine-tuning your AC. And there really are too many good tracks to give them all a proper spotlight. Another favorite of mine is Junk Mail, which plays as an introduction to one of your first fights against another raven. One level has a horror vibe to it, complete with uncomfortable silence, with only an eerie, garbled transmission that repeats over and over. I don't know if whatever's being said explains the level's atmosphere, but it definitely stood out as memorable. So my thanks to Dragon and Company Inc. It really is easy to phone in a soundtrack sometimes, especially techno. But these guys did a great job. Spoiler warning for the little bit of story that there is. Nothing to see here. Move along. So, the protagonist is a heartless bastard. After a few missions of playing both sides, you are forced to accept a mission from Chrome to wreak as much death and destruction as you can in three minutes in the busy downtown streets. As Chrome intends to use the public's fear to increase their reliance on big business, every car, monorail, or guard MT destroyed increases your payout. You are railroaded into doing this mission, because it's what the protagonist canonically would do. It's just another job to them. During the chaos, another raven appears to defend the city. This is the second ranked pilot, Ros Vise, in her AC the Valkyrie. She clearly has you outmatched, and if players aren't careful, you'll be heading to the scrapyard. But the protagonist only has to run out the time to succeed the mission. And you will remember this. You will get revenge. Along the way, you are tasked with dismantling two terrorist organizations, Imminent Storm and Struggle. Well, surprise, surprise. These groups are fronts. Imminent Storm is being backed by Chrome to conduct illegal activities and protest Murakumo, while Struggle was set up by Murakumo as a counterforce to Eminent Storm. 
So the protagonist shrugs their shoulders and takes them both out, getting a fat bank account from both companies in the process. You even get to take out a top-ranked raven in the crossfire. Number 8. Mizuho Kamui Climbing one more rung up the ladder After quite a bit of corporate sabotage, Chrome and Murakumo begin getting desperate. Chrome alerts us that Murakumo has been making excursions to the surface to steal Old World tech to consolidate power. This is the origin of the Human Plus program. Alarmingly, Murakumo has recently commandeered an abandoned space station and is using it to catapult supplies somewhere. All the while, Murakumo sends us intel regarding Chrome's recent bioengineering efforts, creating an army of bugs. It would also seem that your combat tests against prototype NTs have begun bearing fruit. Chrome is slowly building a stockpile of next-gen machines. So our Raven does what they do best, destroying both conglomerates' operations, leading to two catastrophic death rows. Chrome makes a final stand with their prototypes, revealing an enormous that dies in five seconds, while Murakumo fields the orbital laser Justice, the very superweapon that caused the Great Destruction. And they would rather use a doomsday weapon to wipe humanity from existence than concede their control to Chrome. While the player is bad, both of these companies are soulless monsters, treating the worlds like building blocks to be knocked down and built up at their will. But look at these cute corporate operators. This would have made you like them better, right? And so the Raven saves the world from two problems their support helped build in the first place. Both Chrome and Murakumo fall. The corporate stranglehold on humanity is no more. But nothing has changed. New companies rise to take their place. And not everyone is happy with the part you played in the new power dynamic. So, nothing has changed after all. Mission after mission, you are sent into traps. Someone is trying to take you out. And the worst part is, you're not even getting paid for these missions. With Chrome and Murakumo gone, there is a considerable bit of downtime. So, the Raven's Nest holds a few arena matches allowing you to take out third-ranked pilot Balthazar in a 2v1. I guess with less work out there, the Ravens needed a little population thinning. Finally, you meet face-to-face -face with the man out to get you, an unranked Raven known as Boss Savage, pilot of the Sludgehammer. The protagonist swats him like a fly, and continues on, in business as usual. Next, we have a mission directly from Raven's Nest themselves. Someone has broken into headquarters and filled the place with mines. Get rid of them and earn a cool 50k. The enemy MTs are strong, but nothing you can't handle. Swiftly gunning your way through headquarters, you reach the worst section of the game. Armored Core is no platformer. But to add a final spike in difficulty, players must climb a huge vertical room by boosting to moving cubes. To make things even more frustrating, there are turrets on the top and bottom of these cubes, not dealing much damage, but capable of pushing you off of the platforms. With the poor camera control, looking up and down quick enough to keep track of the cubes is difficult, and the floatiness of landing a boost doesn't help. But it is only a matter of time, and you reach the top. And upon entering a vent, you are greeted with... The number one raven, Hustler One, in his armored core, Nineball. 
is easily the strongest enemy in the game. With seemingly endless boosters and precision timing, his aerial combat style is hard to counter. So I fought him in an air duct and clipped his wings. Easy. Emerging from the other end, players face an identical vertical room to the one you just fought Hustler 1 in. Only this one also has its own Hustler 1. True to his Terminator-esque design, Hustler 1 isn't human at all, but an AI controlling a mass-produced AC. Learning from his defeat moments ago, this Hustler 1 isn't going into the vent, so I make a dash for the top, getting nearly destroyed in the process. Through a combination of glancing him every time I could get a lock on him, and getting caught in the blast of his own grenade launcher, I beat the top rank Raven first try. Good thing too, as failing means repeating the entire level again. Imagine having to do that cube room every time you rechallenge the boss. Surviving with 41 health, I take a victory lap and almost die to one final enemy. The beating heart of the Raven's Nest is a large computer, an AI. The lights above the control room are the same lights you see during the Human Plus surgery. I don't know how this is possible exactly, but it is a shocking revelation. Everything that has happened, Chrome, Murakumo, you, has been at the behest of this phantom puppet master. It intended to create order through controlling all sides. Every conflict would be fabricated, orchestrated by the AI to ensure the peace and protection of humanity. But the player went too far. They dismantled Chrome and Murakumo. They upset the balance of order, shattered the illusion. As you destroy the computer, the AI poses a question. Are the survivors of humanity better off free than living under order, even a fabricated order? Has the protagonist's actions saved the world or led to its slow destruction? I don't think the Raven cares as long as we get that 50k. At this instant, the generation of rebirth came to an end. That's all we get as the credits roll. For those who want to soup up their AC, you can now replay completed missions, failed missions, or missions you missed. Completing every mission unlocks the energy and weight restrictions, allowing your AC to be built free from the confines of reality. On the ranking board, we are now number two, but we have unfinished business, don't we? Traveling back to the city attack mission, we can now absolutely devastate the Valkyrie, killing the only righteous raven we have encountered. But now we're number one, baby. Woo! Alone in a ruined post-apocalyptic world, our raven celebrates a meaningless rank in an organization we destroyed. Hidden away deep beneath an ancient temple is a piece of lost technology, the LS-99 Moonlight. It is actually very easy to get, but the climb back up is a pain, so thankfully it's worth it. As the strongest energy sword in the game, the Moonlight's blue blade will fire explosive blasts when combined with the Human Plus ability. Very powerful, but you can get caught in a blast, so be careful. With the advent of 3D gaming, a surge of mecha games were sure to follow. Contemporaries of the time were MechWarrior 2, Gun Griffin, Virtual On, and Brahmin Force. While Virtual On was merely an arena fighter with a mech theme, the other three were first-person simulators of varying complexity. To compare a game where you pilot a robot against another game, where you do much the same thing. Well, that's a fair comparison. But what made Armored Core stand out was the third-person perspective and the option to customize your own mech. Obviously, this was the number one advantage 
Armored Core held over its competitors. Many reviewers stated that while the gameplay and level design was nothing special, the depth of player customization is what kept them coming back for more. Surprisingly, more than a few held the opinion that the real meat of the game was the game's multiplayer. It seems toiling away to make the split screen work was the right call, as I don't think anyone would have used the cable link. Ah, but how cool it must have been to bring your memory card over to a friend's house to test your armored core against theirs. That's the entire reason games like these exist. I can't help but think of an old manga series called Breakage. It wasn't really popular in the West, but the OVA did get a translation. And the basic premise was that there was this arcade pilot simulator where players would suit up and using a VR helmet, conduct player-to-player -player battles and tournaments, either locally or online. Each arcade had aces that would battle another region's aces in semi-turf wars. Players had pilot licenses and could even customize their own mechs with a separate computer program at home. Though not many did, as the balancing of weight and energy levels was seen as an art better left to programmers or true mechamaniacs. The mechs were saved on floppy disks, and the story was set in 2007. Armored Core set out to design something similar on consoles in 1997. I know that arcade simulators are a dead medium for all but the rich and famous nowadays, but we have the technology to make this reality. It wouldn't be realistic looking, but surely designing a working cockpit is easier than getting VR to Star Trek or Ready Player One levels, right? I'm sorry for the rant, but I'm just a man who was denied a youth full of robot piloting. I would have gladly been the nerd that wore a pilot jacket to school. I considered recommending this game to only those interested in the story, thinking that since each new entry in the series was a direct upgrade, the hardcore fans could make their way through the backlog, while I would recommend others to just play the newest game. The more I thought about it, the more I figured this was faulty reasoning on my part. I would still recommend the old days combats, despite each game being a plain game. So why not Armored Core? From Armored Core to Phantasma to Arena, sure each game may be virtually the same, but so is Pokemon. Armored Core fulfills all your mecha grease monkey fantasies, constructing your own robot through blood, sweat, and tears. Often of innocent civilians, but hey, money's money. Anyone in love with the mecha genre will enjoy this game. And while it may be old, it is every bit of fun as it was in 1997. But as time travelers, we earn farther enjoyment. After all, there's still 15 more Armored Core games after this one. So strap in and get ready to move your bed into the garage, because we're only just getting started. Armored Core Project Phantasma is a separate game, but it's basically an expansion pack. Releasing only five months later, on December 4th, 1997, Project Phantasma looks and plays exactly the same. In fact, the Japanese release was an add-on disc. Only the North American version was packaged as a new game. Evidently, this is content that had to be cut from Armored Core to meet a release deadline from Sony. So this technically shouldn't be counted as game five, but hey. Eh. A neat feature is the option to load a save file from Armored Core. Transferring your AC, you spent hours tuning to perfection over to the new game. All of your parts and cash make the journey as well. 
Which is good, as not every part from the first game is in the shop. And there's no Human Plus. So if you want that fully powered Moonlight Sword, you'll need to put in the work before transferring your save. The world, for the most part, is still a wasteland. Working for the mercenary contractor Raven's Nest, the protagonist pilots their armored core to complete missions for whoever is paying. But this time, someone has asked for you specifically. Rather unconventional for Raven's Nest. The message was suspicious. The mission, vague. Infiltrate the underground urban complex, Amber Crown. Likely to be dangerous, our Raven heads out. After all, if they're paying, a Raven can handle a little danger. According to supplement material, this game takes place two years before Armored Core 1. So this protagonist is a different person. Even though I'm stuck with the branded name, Rebel 266, we are no longer at Psycho. With a scant 17 missions, Project Phantasma's draw is the addition of an arena mode where players can fight their way through 49 challenging battles against top ravens. And these ravens are no joke. Even with your powerful maxed out AC, the enemy AI has been upgraded. Boss fights in the first game ended in seconds, but here even the lower ranked ravens can outmaneuver you and buzz around your head like Nineball. This mode is basically designed for people without friends who couldn't experience versus mode. There are 13 maps to pick from, but I don't know why you would want to face the AI in anything but the closed off arena map. You have to chase them around enough as is. You don't need the map doing you any favors. All the enemies have player level health, according to the builds they're running. And speaking of, I don't know if this started earlier, since not everyone uses their sword. But starting at rank 19, everyone going forward is a Moonlight Sword, and they aren't shy about using it. Not so fun when you're on the other end of it. Sadly, no one from the first game returns. These 50 ravens are all new. To make things interesting, there are a few groups vying for supremacy within the arena. There's the Scorpions, a gang of quad ACs, and the AC Tech Research Center, a bunch of panzer nerds using tread ACs. But the strongest group are a bunch of humanoid ACs with a dragon theme, led by the champion of the arena, Necron. This is 100% a Kingsfield 2 reference, as not only is his position as champion of the arena, like the villain in Kingsfield, but his emblem is a black dragon, and his AC is named Black Dragon. In the Japanese release, the number one raven is named Emperor, and his AC, a Claire. As Necron was Mark the Monk Johnson of ASCII's internet handle or something. The hardest enemies aren't the lower tiers, but actually anybody that just jumps around. They are the worst. I found it a little funny that a raven named Brutus, piloting an AC called Backstab, primarily focused on shooting you in the back. The AI is hard to hit when it plays like this, much harder than Necron, since you can barely get a hit on them. Your main prize for conquering the arena is a strong sense of self-worth as a pilot, and that and enough money to clear out the shop and still have millions left over. There's only a handful of new parts, so depending on how much you played the first game, you'll have mountains of cash and nothing to spend it on. As we are a nicer, more honorable merc, every raven we defeat in the arena survives, allowing you to challenge them again anytime you want. Dragon and Company Inc. returns, bringing us some thumping new tracks to fight to. If you enjoyed the music from the first game, then you will love this. Uh, no spoilers this time. There's... 
nothing to spoil. Things start off normal. We head over to the area surrounding Amber Crown and get an anonymous message saying that they'll pay us for wrecking a train depot. After proving ourselves to our anonymous benefactor, we are sent on a mission to rescue a prisoner from a research facility. We walk through the compound unharmed due to porting our save file and rescue Sumika, a fellow raven who was captured to be a lab rat for a series of experiments run by the mysterious group known as Doomsday Organization. Not exactly subtle, are they? Miss Sumika was actually our unnamed benefactor, and now that she's safe, we work for her, exclusively. The protagonist doesn't talk, but they allow themselves to get pulled along as the guard dog for Sumika's resistance force. I don't know if they just have a kind heart, have the hots for Sumika, or just dumb as a box of rocks. But the protagonist of Armor Core 1 would have been working for the Doomsday organization every other mission. Knowing him, he probably would have personally killed Sumika for 50k. So, the plot. Right. The Doomsday organization is working on something called Project Phantasma, which involves melding human consciousness with machine. Sumika wants to destroy this project and everything associated with it leaving us in the dark on what all is actually going on. She just points you to a target, and you shoot everything in your way like a good little raven. One such obstacle standing between you and whatever Phantasma is, is a man named Stinger. He talks tough, but he keeps showing up time and time again, just to get a beating. All the pilots in one at least had the decency to die when they lost a fight. Stinger just keeps crawling back. So, just as we completely destroy the Doomsday Organization, we are told by Sumika that they were being funded by some conglomerate. And that's all the info we get. I suppose it could be Chrome or Murakumo, but who knows? Perhaps this relates to Murakumo's Human Plus experiments. Breaking into the final facility to destroy whatever the Project Phantasma actually is, you fight Stinger again, clean his clock, then watch in a cutscene as he has a mental break and rushes into an adjoining room to steal Project Phantasma. I don't know about you, but I love losing in cutscenes. Our last mission is actually from Stinger himself. Feeling confident that he may actually beat you this time, he sends you his coordinates. He's at the abyss. Uh-huh. So, we finally get to see what Project Phantasma is. It's a red version of the yellow prototype Stinger had earlier. But it has this light show attack that does no damage as long as you're moving. So, that's something. Stinger has melded his mind with Phantasma. Not that it helps him. With Stinger and Project Phantasma destroyed, you head out and meet up with Sumika and we get this amazing ending. We did it. We destroyed Phantasma. Maybe we could have adapted the technology, but I guess it's better this way. to ask for your help again later. You are quite a strong ally to have. Just give me a discount next time, huh? And that's it. We never learn more about the Doomsday Organization. We never find out anything substantial about Project Phantasma. We don't even find out what was up with Stinger. 
after the intriguing story of the first game, this was kind of a letdown. But then again, it is an add-on disc. The Moonlight Sword is here, only if you load a save that possesses it from Armored Core 1. If not, you'll just have to cope with the fact that everyone and their mother has one in this game. Surprisingly, despite being a repackaged add-on disc, reviews in the West were lenient. Basically, everyone was of the opinion that if you liked Armored Core, you would enjoy more of the same in Project Phantasma. One review, though positive, referred to it as a $50 level pack. Rebounding back with the quip, it's like Tomb Raider 2 was the Tomb Raider, except that Armored Core and Project Phantasma are actually good. Oof. So Armored Core was so beloved by its fans that we in the West gave the release of a $50 disc and that Japan got as an add-on a free pass. It was more Armored Core, and we got to experience it, which is more than you can say for Europe. Armored Core Project Phantasma is a good game. The story may not be that engaging, but the arena mode more than makes up for it. It's a shame that this was packaged as a standalone title in the West, as it can only let you down being referred to as such. But if it would have been released as a bundle with Armored Core, well, what can I say but what a deal. But at the moment, is Project Phantasma worth hundreds of dollars? Definitely not. When the Kingsfield Trilogy was completed, From Software split their team into two separate groups. One was headed by Yasuyoshi Karasawa, and would continue raking over the old Zam's K3 coals, to go on to develop the Armored Core franchise. The other group was headed by Shinichiro Nishida, Kingsfield's longtime part writer, part map designer. Now the head of his own project, Nishida faced one glaring issue. The fans were clamoring for Kingsfield 4. The next game would be a first-person action-adventure game, similar to Kingsfield, but it needed to be different enough to stand on its own. It had to move from software, from the shadow of Kingsfield, but unlike Armored Core, this was the same genre, so the challenge was formidable. And there is no clear date when the teams were formed, but considering Kingsfield 3 hit shelves June 21st, 1996, and Shadow Tower released on June 25th, 1998, it had possibly up to two long years in development. The entire idea of having two teams was to stagger the development times to allow two game releases a year, but since Shadow Tower was a whole 11 months after Armored Core. I imagine things did not go smoothly. Long ago, the Kingdom of Eclipse conquered the world. The ruler of this metropolis was a king who wore a horned crown, which bore a magical eye. The king would often boast that this crown was the source of the kingdom's power. This ominous looking crown is what made them conquerors. No one knows how it happened, and we likely never will. But one night, the entire kingdom of Eclipse disappeared. Nothing remains come morning. Only a gigantic hole sat where Eclipse once was. The crown survived the destruction, its eye now closed, quietly sleeping. And so a tower was constructed to seal the crown away never again to tempt man with its power. Present day, the continent is known as Eclipse, its forebearer having fallen into legend. In the holy land of Zepter, the tower is guarded by the kings of surrounding nations, according to ancient traditions. 
Peace had so long reigned that people forgot that the very ground they walked was cursed. Recently, the neighboring kings had begun coveting the one-eyed crown, desiring the power to become a supreme king over all others. As such, bands of mercenaries have started popping up across the realm. The protagonist, Roos Hardy, is one such merc. On his way to a small town in Zepter, at the base of the tower, Roos was traveling to visit a woman who had cared for him since he began his career. A gentle innkeeper he called Granny. Growing up an orphan, Roos drew strength from her warm smile and even warmer meals. But the town was gone. Only rubble remained. There was no sign of life anywhere. The tower, always looming proudly overhead, was missing. Only a piece of its base remained. Within it, a deep hole that looked as if it had consumed the town and the tower itself. Standing there in disbelief, Roos was startled by someone walking up behind him. It was an old man, explaining himself to be a monk whose family had guarded the tower for generations. The old man mistakes Roos for a Whedon, Earl of Morris, due to his longsword. Thinking him to be some adventurous nobleman, the old man explains that the souls of the villagers were consumed by the evil beneath the tower. Several had gone below, and none have returned. Nor would they, as man-made weapons were useless against demons. But time is running out. In a few days, the door to darkness would close, and the souls would be lost forever. The only way to save them was to defeat the demons who trapped them, while only the power of the one-eyed crown could return them to their original bodies. Handing Roos an old, ordinary-looking short sword, the man said that it was rumored by his ancestors to be forged by demon's magic. This sword would be Roos's only hope of survival. Standing before the tower, Roos muttered to himself, he was no hero, he was a merc. There was no money to be gained from going down there, not when he would surely die. Turning to leave, Roos thought of Granny and the taste of her cooking. Sighing to himself, he descended into the depths of the cursed tower. At first glance, Shadow Tower is very similar to Kingsfield. The D-pad controls your movement. L1 and R1 strafe side to side, while L2 and R2 moves the camera up and down. But here is where the similarities end. Retaining the original Japanese Kingsfield controls, triangle is attack, but square raises your shield to defend. For the first time, players can physically use their shield to block attacks, reducing the damage taken. Like the Seath Sword in Kingsfield, you are protected, but depending on the size of the shield, you can't see much. Sadly, though you can see your arm, the appearance will not change according to your gear. I will be honest, this ability is so overshadowed by one other feature that I never really used it enough to know just how much damage it negates. Circle is your magic button, but it is used in conjunction with either your square or triangle buttons, which represent your left and right hands. On each hand, you can equip a ring these rings contain something beyond that of normal humans. Magic. By pianoing the circle button, then the hand of your choice, you perform the spell assigned to the ring. A strange input, but it works without issue once you get the hang of it. Using the same method, other buttons have dual features. Double tapping circle opens your menu. While pressing X, than either the attack or shield commands, players can switch between their currently equipped item and a secondary one they have in reserve. Acknowledging the inadequacies of past titles when it came to being called an RPG, 
Players have stats now, though levels and experience have been removed. Confusing a bit, I know. So upon defeating an enemy, the player is directly given specific attribute points, or soul points, depending on the monster. So you don't get to choose where they go, they just get silently added to your stats. But you can find these little chess piece items, called soul pots, which grant you a specific number of SP to spend on any of the 14 stats you wish. As we will see, strength, which regulates your health, and speed are probably your best options. Now, the defining feature of Shadow Tower, as well as the most controversial one, item durability and degradation. For better or for worse, every piece of gear, besides amulets for some reason, have a durability stat. To add a bit of realism, an item won't even have pristine durability when you find it, but will often be wore down or close to breaking. With every hit given or received, a weapon or piece of armor will lose its luster, and when it hits zero, it breaks, rendering it unusable until it is repaired. There is an item called Dorado's Ashes that repairs our currently equipped gear by a few points. But these consumables are few and far between, and broken gear cannot be equipped anyway, rendering it useless and the player short one critical item until it is repaired. And the problem here lies in the fact that things break at an alarming rate. The sword the old man gave you starts at 10 out of 12, and falls to 9 out of 12 after defeating just two slimes and three spiders in the first area. Thankfully, there is only a set amount of monsters in the game, as respawning monsters would be impossible. To make it even more difficult, any time you use a ring for a spell, it lowers the ring's durability. You could have 10,000 MP, but all is for naught if your ring breaks after 20 spells. So no problem, right? Just cycle your loadout as you pick up new gear. Wrong. Very rarely will you find a weapon or piece of armor sitting on the ground. Most of what you acquire will be through enemy drops, which are random. You could get a weapon, you could get armor, you could get a consumable, you could get a coin, or you could get nothing. Every nothing drop eats at your soul just a little bit more. Another chance wasted. Some enemy spawns are random as well. At any time, when entering a room, there could be an extra enemy or spawn pattern to give you another chance to get new gear. Let's look at a few examples. So, when booting up your game, you come across this chapel room with two slimes. The second slime almost always drops your first helmet, but don't count on it. It's still at the chance. You could do this section ten times over. But on the one run where you make it to a save point, the item won't drop. There could be three green slimes, and you could still fail to get your helmet. There is even a low chance for a blood slime to spawn, which gave me an extra health potion. Players can force these spawns by entering and exiting the area until they appear. In fact, this is required to 100% a zone and acquire all the SP in the game. Interesting to know, but the max amount listed in the menu is wrong. Either from software got their math wrong, or this was tallied up before adding a few more enemies to the game, because the total goes higher than listed. In a cave grave a little farther ahead, there is a room with two bats. The second bat usually drops a longsword, but on one run, the first bat dropped it. Excited that I may get two long swords to play with, the second bat dropped a rare deadly short sword. According to ancient 90s forum conversations, some items are only dropped if players possess certain items, 
some of which either require insane luck, or are impossible to possess at certain earlier sections. This can only be achieved by abusing the versus mode at the start screen, but we'll touch on that mess later. Point is, you are not entitled to anything in Shadow Tower. You are completely at the mercy of Lady Luck, and players would be grateful to receive 140 out of 265 possible items by the game's end. Only the truly insane will save scum every enemy to min-max their gains. I'm crazy, but even I'm not that far gone. You are beginning to understand the difficulty involved in this micromanaging of item durability. Well, the fun doesn't stop there. So, besides the limited consumable, how do we repair gear? In Shadow Tower, there are four merchants, one of which repairs your items. But these demons wouldn't help a human for free. No. The currency players repair their gear with is their health. Yes, that's right. Your health. This soul-sucking demon requires sacrificing your health to fix your gear. Earlier I mentioned health potions. Well, there are no refillable flasks here. Just preset potions hidden around the map, or random drops from enemies. To aid players, two of the other merchants specialize in either health or mana potions. The price, your gear. This creates a vicious cycle where bad players can run out of healing, rendering them unable to repair without selling their gear to repair the others, which rather quickly will whittle down their stockpile until they effectively softlock themselves, requiring a complete restart. The fourth merchant is a shop which exchanges the coins found for various goods, including potions. But there are only 99 of these coons in the game, if you even find them all. Regardless, players are dealing with a limited health pool to finish the game. A case of get good if there ever was one. No hand holding here. Nothing new at this point. But we play as an absolute weakling who must face hordes of monsters to retrieve an artifact and save the world. The difference this time is that we don't have an atmospheric soundtrack to serenade us during our adventures. Taking a big gamble on ambiance, beyond the title screen and FMV cutscene, Shadow Tower has no music at all. The footfalls of our character are all that resonate the silent depths of the tower. This makes the sound design for the enemies more important than ever. Out of the darkness, inhuman shrieks, cries, or laughter taunt the player to wade through the shadows to reach the source of the noise. Most of the time it's a monster, but sometimes it's only a cheesy background track there to be unsettling and make you uncomfortable. It succeeds at first, but after a while, it becomes embarrassingly artificial. True to Jean's original intentions for Kingsfield, Shadow Tower's heavy brooding silence captures the feeling of being alone in a dark and cramped place. Much like the game's cover art, the player will be scared, lonely and crying in some dark corner somewhere. But it isn't the atmosphere of the setting or the piped in haunted house sounds that achieve this, but the gameplay. As with any of the old From Software games, save points are still very much a desired thing. But the true oasis in this den of darkness is the repair merchant markers. Anytime you find a merchant tablet, a save point is usually close by. So there is an overabundance of saves, graciously given due to the blistering difficulty. Merchant tablets are unfortunately split between four possibilities so your chances of finding a chance to repair are slim. In fact, there are only five such points in the entire game. Hope you enjoy backtracking. The art of micromanaging your gear reaches its zenith in the third of the seven zones, Fireworld. With the introduction of one specific enemy type, your stockpile of healing and gear 
reaches a critical breaking point. The next repair point isn't unlocked until you complete the entire zone, with the last point you discover being at the start of zone 2. Is a 10 minute trek back worth it, if the enemies can deal an eighth of your total health per hit? Even having used a limited consumable, limiting their ranged magic damage. In this midpoint surge in difficulty, will either forge a hardened player, who will see the game through to the end, or it will break you. Every time I died and had to replay half an hour of progress, I wish someone would give me a rag blindfold, so I could crawl into some dark hole somewhere. Anything to avoid reliving the fire world and its berserkers. But there's no trick, you just have to get good and get hit less. Speaking of the enemies, it seems that enemy variety was a core element in the design, as every floor of the tower has different monsters populating it, with many only being seen contained within a single room, or possibly seen only a single time. Despite listing 150, there are 151, maybe 152, different monsters in the game. On account of the rare spawns, I didn't see all of them, and there are no English guides chronicling how to do so. So the Japanese community is your only source, wherever this information may lie. Like this one section here, I noticed that enemies kept respawning in these secret rooms, so I continued farming them for SP. Eventually, after enough time, this weak crab spawned. It died instantly, and didn't give very much SP, but this was the only time I saw one of these creatures. Frantically, I backtracked the entire game to see if I could find any other unseen beasts, but to no avail. Wasted a good hour, too. The wealth of variation in the monster designs is great, but while seeing new enemies is neat, I can't help but feel it was intended to be a selling point. As mentioned, while it makes sense that certain monsters would reside only in certain environments, it seems wasteful to only encounter some monsters once or twice. I guess this is nitpicking over being given more than we needed, but with the issues I have with the core gameplay, I feel it would have been alright with less monsters, and more work fixing the durability mechanic. Considering the possible two-year development, I am sure this version we received was the best they could do with what they had, so there is no sense harping on them about it, I suppose. Perhaps this was a side effect of the long development time. While everyone else was figuring out how to salvage the game, the designers just kept making more enemies. It could explain the overabundance of one-off encounters. The environmental design, while not graphically stunning, is a great improvement over Kingsfield. Same as with the enemies, each zone has a theme, while each area within a zone often has unique textures not seen anywhere else. From the dark dungeons of the human world to the flame and steel of the fire world, there is a minute attention to detail everywhere. While many of the secret doors are just plain opening walls, many floors have unique animations that are never reused elsewhere. The frighteningly loud crumbling walls in the human world, a single metal door in fire world, or the strange folding walls of the beast world. With how many unique assets there are, I can't help but wonder just how vast their original intentions for the game were. The human world contains a few torture tools here and there, but the trailer shows more that were removed just before release. Presumably, there were corpses originally decorating the area to give it an even grimmer tone, but they most likely had to be removed due to ratings. A lot of work went into this game, and I hate to see that it was undermined by the flawed equipment systems, but what can you do? Gone is the wide explorable settings of Kingsfield 2 and 3. In a rerun of Kingsfield 1, we must stumble down through the seven sections, referred to as worlds, of the tower. In the human world, a labyrinth of dungeons and torture chambers constructed by humans that worship the demons. The earth world, 
a series of tunnels mined by dwarves, filled with poison and dangerous plant life. The Fire World, a land of fire and steel, patrolled by robot guardians. Water World, a realm someone mislabeled for fun. Besides one fountain, all of the water in Water World has been tainted and become acid. Great. Illusion World, a temple ruin filled with randomly tossed together monsters. Beast World, the house of the demon lord, Master Death. And Death World, the final zone and location of the One-Eyed Crown. Much like Kingsfield 1, the progression is linear, and besides one or two areas that are optional, there isn't much room to explore off the beaten path. In a step backwards, the story is actually worse than Kingsfield 1. Now this is subjective, but besides the user manual, the story is even more threadbare than usual. There is almost no flavor text that reveals anything about the game's world. You could say that it's mysterious, but I find it highly disappointing that the few strands of lore we are given lead nowhere, left up to the player's imagination. What is most telling that something was seriously wrong? Back when this released, From Software had entire detailed maps of every area in the game put up on their website. Secret doors and everything. Labeled items, keys, shops, the works. I don't know if this was a concession to the majority that thought the game is too difficult or unfair, but this doesn't seem like a move From Software would take without serious thought. You probably won't play this game, but this is a spoiler warning all the same. I don't think there's much to spoil, but this could be a tipping point of whether someone decides to give Shadow Tower a chance or not. So here's what we know. We are Roos Hardy, a weak yet manly mercenary who decided to brave a cursed hell pit to eat his granny's food again. Strangest reasoning I've seen so far, but hey. The tower has been sucked into the depths and become the Shadow Tower. The game talks as if the tower has been inverted, but this doesn't make sense. The first zone is described as being built by demon worshippers. So was this originally the first floor of the tower? Was this secretly a dungeon used by the king's ancestors to sacrifice innocents to the demons of the upper floors? It couldn't be, as the second floor was a mine. How big was this tower? Nothing makes sense. The lore talks as if these floors were always here, yet the tower just sank a short while ago when it engulfed the town above. The only solid theory is that the tower was built upon the old hull of the Kingdom of Eclipse. Nothing in the English game confirms this, but it is the only answer. These floors had to be lurking beneath the useless human-made tower, which sealed the crown, until one day, the crown was recovered and pulled to the deepest level of the Shadow Tower. So Roos makes his way through the first level, scavenging any demon-made gear he can get his hands on to help him in surviving this quest. For some reason, the hit detection is abysmal, but like most things, you'll have to get used to it. In some dark forgotten corner, we meet what is referred to as a fat mole, a friendly talking hamster rat creature. They will be one of our only friends in this tower. This is where we learn the history of this floor, and then they give us a coin and roll away. Throughout the game, whenever an enemy is killed, Roos earns SP, or soul points. These can also be earned with the use of items called soul pods. True to their name, these are souls, the 5,000 souls of the townspeople Roos is trying to save. 
So with every victory, Roos recovers more innocent souls. But what does it mean that he uses them to grow stronger? It doesn't sound like a good thing, as this is exactly what the demons are using them for. I wonder which one is Granny. Trudging through the Earth world, Roos bumps into a wooden doll woman. Listening to her story, Roos learns that she is the demoness, Rurufan, who is imprisoned in this doll by the Earth demon, Deferosoni Gigas. We agree to free her and continue on our way. Upon encountering a path covered in poison, a door accosts us, telling us to follow him to a poison-free route past. This was Gigas, who will soon get what is coming to him when we get past this door. Running through the poison, we circle around and confront Gigas, easily dispatching the cowardly door. Sealed within a snow-white crystal casket, we release the powerful Rurufan, who gives us our first magic ring. Second and final friend acquired. Nearby, there is a knight struggling with holding up a boulder. Sacrificing your currently equipped weapon, you can save him. Take more than 20 seconds, and he is crushed, forever blocking players from that area of the game. Losing a sword, we learn that he is a knight who followed his king into the tower, a King Kells. Left to hold the boulder up, his king and comrades continued on searching for the crown. Now we face the first issue in the translation. Besides this instance, this is the only time we hear the name Kells. In the Japanese release, there are three named kings. King Kells, a King Rudo, and King Philip, the king of Eclipse, an original owner of the One-Eyed Crown. The English translation decides from this point on to just combine them all into one person, a King Edward. Our first boss encounter, the ruler of Earthworld, is with Apollos, one of the seven knights who served King Rudo. Waltext mentions that members of King Rudo's party turned on each other. Upon defeating Apollos, he says that he was betrayed by his king and turned to darkness. Whether he was left for dead, and his want for vengeance turned him into a demon, or if King Rudo himself was responsible, I don't know. Either way, after this, we lose the trail of King Kells and King Rudo. Neither made it to the crown. Both probably died pathetically somewhere in the darkness. In the miserable fire world, we defeat a band of djinn and their king, and with the help of the magic hamster, defeat the fire elemental, Braxis, and warp to a ruined realm which houses the world's boss, the Ebony Knight. Sadly, we don't learn anything about who this man is, besides that he wishes to have an honorable duel with worthy foes, like Roos. The water world houses a pure healing fountain, but its guardian, Akriel tells us that it can only be gathered with a holy crystal pitcher, which was stolen by demons. Retrieving the pitcher is easy. It is only a room or so over from the fountain, and upon returning, Akriel disappears, allowing players to heal themselves at the fountain whenever they wish. Interestingly, both Akriel and the Mole lack a race listing in the creature guide. Instead of demon or otherwise, both are listed as unknown, curious, and somewhat ominous. Cruelly, unless players backtrack to the Fire World's repair point, the next room over has a one-way drop that locks you off from getting back to the fountain until you not only complete Water World, but also Illusion World and half of Beast World. 
Water Worlds gimmick is forcing the players to wade through corrosive poison, which breaks your gear. What a fun level. The boss is a joke, a demon sorcerer that you can just shoot with arrows. For once the bow is a great weapon, powerful and with unlimited arrows, as long as the durability holds up. The sorcerer has nothing to add to the mystery surrounding this world. Just a someone like you will never be king. Illusion World is the dumping ground of all of the weird monsters. Boxing demons, gladiators, and mollusks. And there is no theme to the level besides harlequins and Mesoamerican ruins. Truly a match made in heaven. The upside is that there are so many coons to be found here that when you eventually find the warp back to the fountain, you won't need it. You'll be swimming in potions. After defeating a group of jesters, you face the ruler of Illusion World. I am called Disguise. It will be my pleasure to destroy you now. Once again, we have no clue what is going on in this tower. We have loads of questions, and there's no one with any answers. Moving on to the Beast World, we are greeted by a Serpent Man, who is the emissary for Master Death. He even gifts us a katana. How nice of them. In the English translation, Master Death is called Necron. Shocker, I know. The enemies in the second area are invisible if you don't place an item you find in the first area. Annoying if you're a player who rushes through. But I happened to pick it up already, so this was no problem. Since the Beast World is small, only having two separate sections, this invisibility gimmick is easily overcome. I actually didn't run into any invisible monsters before reading the wall text telling me to place the item, so the trick was absolutely wasted on me. At the end, you have an honorable fight against the Master of Death, and while I'm sure his little wooden spear does quite a bit of damage, circle strafing him and keeping out of the range of his magic makes the fight a piece of cake. To reaffirm my theory, Rurufan explains that the tower and its six worlds are symbolic reflections of the king's heart. Hmm. Finally, we enter the death world, ironically not the realm of Master Death. This is the location of the dark castle of King Philip, keeper of the one-eyed crown. Fighting through his knights, we reach the throne room and meet face to face with the ancient king. Surprisingly, he hasn't turned into a demon. He's just an undead human, a big old skeleton. He doesn't do much damage, but he has a lot of health. And after four minutes of poking each other back and forth for chip damage, I look up his creature entry to find that he is invincible unless his heart is destroyed first. Tucking tail, Roos makes a tactical retreat. Down some nearby hallway, the king's heart is guarded by eyes that shoot lasers. No big deal. Taking care of the heart, you return to the throne room to find the king has made a tactical retreat of his own. Behind the throne is a secret passage, where you meet up with Ruurfan one final time. She tells you to defeat the Hollow Mage, ruler of Death World, and only then can you reach the king and claim the crown. Saying her goodbyes, Ruurfan gives you all of the human souls she possessed, a large 53 soul pod. On a lighter note, you have one final chat with the hamster. Oh, you're not finished yet? Oh, hurry up and kill them all! <laughs> After the exhilaration of fighting the King of Eclipse, the rest of the Death World is tame in comparison. Some demons seal off your magic, and you must challenge the Saturday morning villain that is the Hollow Mage, with only your weapons, which is no problem. He sits back and laughs at you, protected by an AoE burst of curse magic, but it doesn't protect him from arrows. 
Having defeated all six lords of inverted Castlevania, the final door is unlocked. Stepping inside the cool mouth door, you are taken to the Void Realm, where you must face the king's right hand, the Black Knight, Balrog. His hits pack quite a punch, but circle strafing works just fine. For his second phase, he is much faster, lacking his armor and does a staggering 2,000 damage a hit. But surely you upped your strength, right? Nothing a few potions can fix. After felling Balrog, the king himself steps up to defend his crown. Having destroyed his heart, King Philip has turned into a giant slime, about as weak as one too. After hurting him once, the king recoils, calling for help. A few more attacks, and he is no more. Something that bothers me is his mention of us allying with the rodent. Why does he know about the talking hamster? Would From Software make something with a voice like this? Secretly, a Machiavellian demon puppet master. <laughs> I mean, probably. But it's never brought up again, so the truth dies with the king. Defeating the king earns an entry in the book, The Demon King. And while the stats given are the Slime King's boss stats, the picture is of the one-eyed crown. Hmm, it wasn't King Philip that Rurufan was referring to as the lord and creator of the Shadow Tower, but the crown itself. The one-eyed crown is either an evil deity trapped within a magic crown, or its true form has simply always been an ominous looking crown. Either way, a neat if obvious twist. So, reaching our journey's end, what does Roos do? Well, it looks like he wished to become king, huh? Now, this could just be the crown offering a vision, tempting Roos to take the same path as King Philip. But given that the crown sits on a stool and is not atop the king's head, like Philip was described, this is likely Roos. So, that's the end of Shadow Tower. Roos presumably saved the souls he retrieved, and became the supreme king over the lands. And with the insidious flash the crown gives at the end, I'm sure his new kingdom lived happily ever after. But we aren't done yet. You want to go back and grind out all the enemies, right? Well, the option is there. One last treat is the intriguing versus mode on the title screen. This frolicking romp is a two-player battle mode where two friends with two separate Shadow Tower save files can compete in either 1v1 or 3v3 fights with the monsters from their respective creature encyclopedias. To spice things up, each player can wage a piece of gear on their victory. The camera is locked and the players control their monsters from an awkward side perspective. The fights are quick, wonky, and not very satisfying. For as strong as they were in the campaign, these monsters crumple like you're playing Samurai Showdown. Back in the day, if you could find someone else who played Shadow Tower, this could have been a fun mode. But today, while it attracts curiosity, it lacks any sort of fun factor. Really, this mode is only for loner completionists to transfer items over 
to get a 100% save file. There is no sort of moonlight in this game. Tragic, I know. Then Shadow Tower and Armored Core were being developed simultaneously after Kingsfield 3. Nishida probably didn't even think of including the sword, as the point was to distance themselves from Kingsfield, not give fans more reason to compare the two. After coming this far, it's no surprise that Shadow Tower didn't sell very well. Critics were brutal on all fronts, since the US didn't receive the game until October of 99, and with the release of the PlayStation 2 right around the corner, the graphics got hammered. Some even complained that it looked worse than Kingsfield 2. It's interesting that the graphics were the unifying element in Shadow Tower's detraction. But the journalists, I suppose Shadow Tower was no more unfair or difficult than Kingsfield, so no one brought it up. For the first time, a From Software game was hit with 3s and 5s out of 10. Famitsu gave it a 27 out of 40, which is one of its better scores, and much too generous, considering Kingsfield 3 got a 28. In an interview just one year later, Shinichiro Nishida was asked about a possible sequel to Shadow Tower. He opened with the determinant, we have no such plans at all. Originally, we wanted to make the Shadow Tower scenario one in a new series, instead of continuing Kingsfield. However, although we kept saying that it was different from Kingsfield, it was unfortunately not different enough. Many users considered it to be the equivalent to Kingsfield 4. To From Software and Nishida, Shadow Tower was a failure. There are two camps when it comes to Shadow Tower. Some think of it as a misunderstood classic, requiring careful item management and skill to experience Shadow Tower as it was meant to be played. But going by the reviews and conversations online, most thought of it as unfair and unplayable. While I think the truth lies somewhere in between, Shadow Tower is a deeply flawed experience. Kingsfield was often called slow and tedious, but true tedium is spending a majority of your time micromanaging durabilities and menus. The Shadow Tower team's experimentation with realism took a step too far. In real life, swords require maintenance and would definitely chip and wear down while fighting your way through hordes of monsters. But it's like you're fighting with prop weapons. Everything breaks much too fast, crumbling like they're made of graham cracker. It could be said that it is an intensive system that players must operate around to survive the Shadow Tower. It could also be said that it is not at all fun and makes the game a chore to play. But if you can force yourself to see past the flaws, there is a solid game lurking beneath. With the popularity of Armored Core, From Software continued to grow as a company, and once again, divided their teams. Soon they would be flooding the market with titles, producing four to five a year. Now Toshifumi Nabashima, the director of Armored Core, got his chance to step up to bat. During this time, a few teams started adding personal credits behind the From Software logo allowing us to track their progress. This team was known as the CS3 division. In most of From Software's past works, rooms were barren. Rarely would there be furniture, and if there was, it was never interactable. From the simple desire to open a drawer, Echo Knight was born. 
1913, the passenger liner Orpheus was lost somewhere in the Atlantic. A private vessel, owned by the wealthy Rockwell family. The Orpheus was carrying the entire family and their guests when it suddenly disappeared. According to the official story, the Orpheus was caught in an unexpected storm, and despite the expert crew, was lost. Search teams were sent out, but an exhaustive investigation turned up nothing. No trace of the ship was ever found. All passengers were presumed dead. The case remains unsolved. 1937, America. 25-year-old Richard Osmond has received a letter from his estranged father. Its contents, a small key and no message. Perplexed, Richard has no time to ruminate on this mystery, for he is interrupted by the ringing of his telephone. In a feat of miraculous timing, the police inform him that his father's house has just burned down. His father is missing. Arson is suspected. And so, Richard makes his way to his hometown of Anchor, to sift through the ashes of his father's home for clues. What Richard doesn't know is that this key would not only unlock the secrets to his father's past, but tie his fate to the mystery of the vanished ocean liner. Time will be altered, destinies will be changed, and Richard's life will never be the same. In a dramatic shift for From Software, Echo Knight is an adventure game more in line with PC point-and-click titles of the era. Slightly ahead of its time, players explore 3D space, locating objects and solving puzzles, much like 2000's Real Mist. There is no combat. The only weapons at the player's disposal are the abilities typically found in a point-and-click, clicking on things, picking up or using items, and running away. But unlike Mist and its gaggle of imitators, Echo Knight has enemies who will chase you down and send you packing, right back to the title screen. Developed mainly as another experiment, some small items, like chairs or step stools, can be picked up and moved around rooms. There are not many cases of this actually helping in your investigation, but the option is there. Another completely excessive feature is the addition of a fully functioning day and night cycle. As you roam the Orpheus, time will drift by, day will turn to night, and the pages of the calendar will fly by. Yes, much like your footsteps, which it keeps track of for some reason. It also keeps track of what day exactly in 1937 it is. It's neat, and while it allows for some nice views off of the deck, this day and night cycle only factors into a single moment of the game. Like they had to find some way to incorporate it into the story organically, to draw attention to the fact, oh, there's a day and night cycle in this game. There's even a hidden meteor shower that players can witness if you happen to be outside at a specific time. The default control scheme is some disgusting mess that maps left and right strafe to R1 and R2, while looking up and down is L1 and L2. Thankfully, they give you four configurations, one of which is the classic Kingsfield. Ah, much better. There are also a surprising number of settings that can be customized in the menu. The player's walk and turning speed can either be sped up or slowed down. Amazing improvement. Just wish I would have found this before I completed the game. Though convenient, I am certain high speeds would make hitting the light switches harder in high stress situations. But that is the price one pays for dashing about, I suppose. You can toggle on or off the head bobble, change the menu fonts, and even remove the HUD reticle for a more immersive experience, which I would recommend against doing, 
as the star reticle lights up a faint blue, when you can pick up or inspect something. It makes judging when something is or isn't in range, less of a hassle than it need be. Due to the real-time gameplay, Echo Knight is a forefather of sorts to the modern-day walking sim. You play as a weak protagonist, who must navigate the puzzle of an encounter, rather than solve things with brute force. The ghosts encountered in Echo Knight are repelled by light, so naturally the player's greatest weapon against them is fumbling in the dark for the light switch. Atmosphere takes precedence over challenging gameplay. The goal is to submerse players in the story, not bog them down with skill checks. The soundtrack was composed in-house by the Frequency Sound Development Team, led by Kenichiro Sagawa, newcomer Tsukasa Saito, and Kota Hoshino, who we will see more of in the future, composed the opening and ending themes respectively, with Sagawa handling the ending music. The music is melancholic and foreboding, adequate for the dramatic twists and turns that the story takes. When it's present, the soundtrack strolls in and sets the stage, pulling the player into a scene. But once the scene ends, much like Shadow Tower, we are left with only eerie silence and our footsteps to keep us company. This infrequent use of accompaniment creates tension. And when the music does begin, the player knows to pay attention. Minimalistic, but effective. Echo Knight may come off as a horror title at first glance, but Richard's adventure on the cursed ghost ship never reaches a point where the word scary accurately captures the mood. And the story is peppered with moments of tense peril, but the long sections of searching for items and chatting up the friendly, though ghostly passengers and crew creates an air of intrigue that tips the scale more towards mystery than horror. And the fact that you only need to flip on the lights makes defeating the ghosts feel somewhat childish. The design just doesn't really lend well to horror. Look at the ghosts. They're all women or little girls in Edwardian era fashion. If I were in Richard's shoes, I would be terrified. But in a game, a ghost girl throwing tables at me is a bother, not a fright. Like a classic gothic tale, while the supernatural may play a leading role in the tragedy, human nature is the true culprit. Echo Knight tells a wistful tale of greed, misfortune, and this f***ing cheating at blackjack. True to the spirit of a point and click, a majority of the player's time will be spent scouring floors and looking behind sofas for items that may help with the puzzle at some point. Thankfully, most of the puzzles are relatively simple. And there is no backwards point-and-click logic to be found here. Each item will have an obvious use somewhere nearby. And getting to the puzzles themselves, most are straightforward. When an item has outlived its use, it disappears from your inventory automatically, so there is no clutter to confuse you. Probably the high point for me was the telegraph puzzle. It isn't difficult, as there is a poster on the wall that lists the translation for Morse code. But the act of solving this puzzle was fun, as it was more engaging than opening a door with a key I found hidden somewhere. Two puzzles feature solutions without a simple explanation. The first is a set of dolls with flags. These flags are naval semaphore, of which there is no key located anywhere in game. Players must place four coins, labeled A, B, C, and D. Strangely, the flags spell out D, A, M, and R. Complete nonsense. The solution requires players to look at the fuzzy images on the coins themselves. The letters and flags are a red herring. In the second puzzle, players must listen to the tune on a music box 
and replay it on a cathedral organ. It isn't very difficult. You can get it with some trial and error. But I know how some people feel about music puzzles. Numerous lost souls of the cursed passengers and crew roam the Orpheus. Richard can talk to them, learning a bit more about what happened in 1913. Each ghost has something keeping them from passing on. This could require Richard to delve into her past and solve some personal issue. Or it could be as simple as simply turning on the lights for them. Helping these ghosts cross over is the second key element of gameplay. And this drunk ghost here wishes to taste a particular drink his friend would make. So Richard must start investigating the boat, only having the name Ed to go on. In a nearby cabin, an artist has scribbled a message on a table, signed Ed Morey. The lounge has a collection of paintings, one graphic piece, signed E.M. For some reason, the liquor behind the counter perfectly matches up to the Conan the Barbarian theme. With this complex puzzle solved, you can mix the drink and move the story onward. Whenever you help a ghost cross over, you are awarded with something called an astral piece. These pieces can be traded to someone for holy water, which for the most part is useless. I never used it once. But collecting all 26 astral pieces is required to unlock two of the game's four endings. Now, let's get to the most notorious section. On board, there is a casino. During your searching, players can find vouchers for casino chips. Well, those are redeemed here. Three of your 26 ghosts are lounging around waiting for you to suffer their rigged minigames. Players must win at least 100 chips to unlock blackjack. To do this, you have the option of either roulette or slots. Pick roulette. At least you have control over the odds. The slot machine will never give you those chips. However you choose to play this, players should save at the medbay nearby and reload upon losing. You could take a gamble on a big payout, but laming it out with corner bets is the fastest way to never have to hear this track again. Once you unlock Blackjack, the manager blocks the door, making saving impossible. To get these ghosts to cross over, you must beat the blackjack dealer, Elizabeth Cronest, at her own game. The goal is to turn your 100 chips into 200. Good luck. As someone who has completed the hardest difficulty of Resident Evil 7 Blackjack, I can say this isn't the worst I've ever seen a dealer cheat, but it's close. Nothing you get is safe. You have a pair of face cards, She'll hit three times and get a 21. So she starts with an ace. Well, there's a 50-50 chance the other card is a face card, giving her blackjack, but the insurance option doesn't work. Whether you can correctly call out her blackjack or not, regardless of what the final outcome on the table is, you still lose the hand, losing five chips instead of your opening bet of 10, making the insurance pointless I don't think whoever designed this minigame understood blackjack, as players can use the insurance on any hand, creating a way for players to cheat and pocket five chips on any hand where she will obviously win. It took me 40 minutes to beat this casino, the last 15 of which were spent consecutively being berated by Miss Cronest until the game felt sorry for me and gave me blackjack after blackjack. I don't think I could ever understand the heart of a person whose ghost is forever trapped, unable to cross over, without losing at something like blackjack. How can someone be such an irredeemable piece of that even their co-workers refuse to cross over until they can see her lose at cards? May I remind you that their souls have been trapped on a cursed boat for 24 years, but no. You can unlock the good ending 
until she loses at blackjack. Major spoilers beyond this point. I'm going to be spoiling the entire story of a story-driven experience. So please, move ahead in an orderly fashion if you wish to avoid ruining the mystery of the Orpheus. When Richard arrives at his father's house, it is a burned-out husk. As is the standard American police procedure, a cop invites him inside to poke around for anything that could help with their investigation. The policeman, a Marvin Foremast, informs us that Richard's father, Henry Osmond, was an artist. Possibly, as they haven't been able to find any tools of the trade in the home. Hmm, could have something to do with it all being highly flammable. Not a detective or anything. Just a thought. It's peculiar that he's even telling Richard this, as unless they are significantly more estranged than it appears, he should know his father's profession. But being a silent first-person protagonist, it is up to us, the player, to self-insert as Richard and solve this mystery without his input. Add, is our father an artist? To the list of mysteries. Officer Foremast stands guard over the entrance, leaving us free to explore the dangerous crumbling building unsupervised. In what appears to be his father's bedroom, Richard finds a grandfather clock that is in marvelous shape considering the state everything else is in. After unlocking the clock with the key he received, he winds it up and the clock hand starts spinning uncontrollably resting once more on three o'clock. As the chimes ring out, the grandfather clock shifts aside, revealing a secret passage leading to a hidden basement. Upon crawling through, Richard stoops down to pick up a red book, conspicuously placed on the stairway, and is suddenly transported somewhere else. Having a bit of an out-of-body experience, we watch an orange-haired man carrying a bag board a train, leaving the anchor terminal. We get a few shots of a train speeding across the bridge, and entering a tunnel, we regain control. Finding himself on a train, Richard is oddly calm about this whole thing, politely attempting to make conversation with the young man or the grandfather-granddaughter pair, none of whom seem particularly chatty. So he gets a little adventurous, climbing up to the roof, but there's nothing up there. Heading back to the front car, we pass by the young man, and upon entering, we find the conductor knocked unconscious. Picking up the crank beside him, Richard rushes back to the rear car, only to find the door locked. Putting two and two together from his earlier trip to the roof, Richard climbs back up and opens the skylight with the crank. Inside, we witness a standoff. The youth is pointing a pistol at the old man, while the old man is threatening to shoot his granddaughter. It appears that the youth has been pursuing the man for some time, and in preparation for being caught, the old man kidnapped his granddaughter to use her as a hostage, knowing the young man was too kind-hearted to allow an innocent soul to die. The youth drops his pistol, and is promptly shot by the grandfather. Beyond the locked door, a police officer, who just heard the gunshot, asks if everything is alright. The grandfather exits the scene to go pay for his silence. Pulling himself to his feet, the youth apologizes to the girl for scaring her, revealing that her grandfather has been possessed by demons. For a long time, he had chased those demons with a blue stone, a stone he hands to the girl, asking her to keep it safe until they meet again. He promises that it will protect her from anything. As they part ways, the two exchange names. The girl is Crea Rockwell, and the man is Henry Osmond, Richard's father. Returning to find Henry gone, the grandfather calmly makes his way to the rear of the train. 
climbing down from the roof, Richard rushes past Crea to witness the final confrontation between his father and the old man. Henry pleads with the man, trying to convince him that he is possessed by a stone, but has no luck. A man possessed by a cursed artifact won't listen to reason when he is possessed by a cursed artifact. Go figure. Held at gunpoint and with nowhere to run, Henry throws himself from the train, vowing to return, naming the old man as William Rockwell. With Richard just standing there having watched the whole scene, William scoffs at being possessed, pulling out a dagger that glows an ominous red. Talking aloud to himself, he swears he would never hand the dagger over to anyone, and finally noticing Richard's presence, whirls around, knife in hand, only for us to get pulled back to our own time. What an opening! So many questions. How did we just go back in time? What is the story behind Henry and Rockwell? What are the blue and red stones? How does this tie in with the disappearance of the Orpheus? Was Richard's father involved? A great introduction to draw players into the mystery. A little cinematic je ne sais quoi for From Software's first foray into a story-driven game. The zoom on William Rockwell at the end is chilling, his former cheerful grandpa mask cracking, revealing the demon beneath. Congrats on taking the time to make two separate models for the Switch. It was worth it. Instantly I'm hooked, and I don't know about Richard, but come hell or high water, I'm eager to learn everything I can about this mystery. Once again, finding himself in the stairway to the basement, Richard holds the red book, Henry's journal. Skimming it, we learn that, possessed by the power of the dagger, William Rockwell murdered Henry's parents, and from that moment on, he made it his life's mission to avenge them. An entry notes that the encounter aboard the train happened in 1899, so somehow we were transported 38 years into the past. Despite William, the knife, and the entire Rockwell family disappearing on the Orpheus in 1913, Henry didn't feel at peace. Nothing would be for certain until he personally boarded the lost ship and ended things once and for all. So I guess he didn't have anything to do with it. In the basement, a magic painting transports Richard to the Orpheus, setting our journey in motion. Perhaps Henry was an artist of sorts after all, huh? But we are not sent to the past this time. Strangely, our menu calendar lists the date as November 17, 1937, two days in the future. Immediately, the shadowy form of the captain apprehends Richard, leading him to a well-lit cabin, advising him to stay there for his own safety. Of course, to complete the game, we can't. Exploring the ship, Richard is attacked by the ghost of a little girl, but someone turns on the lights and scares her off. The disembodied voice of Richard's father explains that light is our only defense against vengeful spirits. Like the captain, he tells us to stay put. It is his destiny to see this through to the end, not ours. Ignoring the warnings, Richard continues exploring the ship, helping ghosts he meets along the way. In a locked closet in the captain's cabin, we find a book that looks the same as the one Crea had on the train. Les Etoiles, French for the stars. Hearing another voice, Richard is pulled to a lone observatory, surrounded by wolves. Curiously, the date is November 15th, 1937 but it is regarded as the past. I suppose the 17th is our new present. The first floor of the observatory is strange. Display cases with blacked out glass flank the walls. The centerpiece is a rotating astronomical globe. Reading the book that brought us here, we are met with a mysterious prose. 
To every soul, to wandering souls, I am waiting where the stars live. Those that challenge fate, those whose fate is lost, I am waiting where the stars live, beyond the sun. The one who held the comet to the sun, I am waiting, I am waiting. Ominous. Curiously, the elevator is missing the button for floor two. So floor three it must be. The large telescope is broken, but a crude drawing on the blackboard hints at our next move. Holding the book up to a plaque of the sun, we are transported to yet another location. Please come in. Yes, there is some voice acting. Kind of a mixed bag as not every role is voiced. Regrettably, the entire intro train section is without voice acting. Odd choice, for sure. All of the ghosts are voiced, and the English delivery is charming. Not great, but odd enough to give the game character. So how goes your journey aboard the ship? It seems pretty fun. You don't have to be scared. I just possess an alien power. I am blind. I created that book you possess as a substitute. I am able to see the world through the book as it travels around the world. Yes, the entire world. <laughs> so, this guy is evil. There's no way he isn't. But giving him every astral piece is the only way to unlock two of the endings. That and he gives you holy water, which will aid players who get hit often. The blind medium feels off, not because he is so obviously creepy, but because until you give him all 26 astral pieces, he just repeats the same dialogue over and over. Your reward is always a bottle of holy water, nothing else like talking to a broken record. Very strange, considering how useless the holy water is. Oh, I almost forgot. Let me give this to you. This stone holds your destiny. Take good care of it. Continuing on with our investigation, Richard meets the captain one last time. Promising to save everyone, we set out with the other half of the blue stone Henry gave to Kreia. We still really don't know what's going on, but our current goals are to survive, find Henry, find Kreia, and presumably defeat William and the Red Stone. As Richard talks with various passengers, the story starts to unfold. Ed, the artist, went insane after witnessing the birth of a demon. William, most likely. In the secret room he was locked in, there is a broken display case. But what did it hold? The dagger? Wouldn't it make sense, since William carried it with him. As far as I know, the game never answers what was in this case, which is a little frustrating. Running into the little girl again, Richard is defenseless in the dark, as the girl is body blocking the light switch. So he flees, bumping into a little boy ghost in the process. He tells us that she, the little girl, is alone and scared, and just wishes for someone to find her body. Once again, Richard is randomly sent back in time. Now is the perfect time to address this. I have no idea how we are jumping around in time, like it's Quantum Leap. Richard is being fully transported, as he can be seen, recognized, and interact with others. But how is this happening? The first few times required picking up an object, which took us somewhere associated to the original owner's memories. Some of the ghosts just talk to you and pull you somewhere which still makes sense given what we can understand of his power. But this little boy, 
a random stranger on the boat, sends us back in time to a gold mine just by saying that we need to help the little girl. Yeah, I don't know. So we are now exploring one of the old Rockwell gold mines, the source of their wealth. After having some fun riding in minecarts and doing some light puzzling, we meet the girl's father. It seems that there was a cover-up. The public excuse for closing the mines was that they were mined out, but the real reason was that people were disappearing. His daughter was one of those who vanished. Richard finds him digging, another in a long line of digging from software NPCs. He says that his daughter Claudia has to be there somewhere, as he found her favorite doll nearby. Breaking through a large rock, he finds his daughter's body. Taking the doll, Richard leaves the father to grieve and returns to the Orpheus. In giving Claudia her doll, she sheds her ghostly features and looks at peace as she finally passes on, allowing us to explore the cabin suite and acquire a tailcoat to help us get past a snooty ghost upstairs. But just as he grabs the suit, someone knocks Richard out from behind. Waking up in the medical bay, Richard's health levels are critical, and we've lost two and a half days. Interesting to note, but your health bar is the blue gem, and upon taking damage, it slowly turns red. A neat little nod to the story. The ghost of the doctor has us locked in, so Richard goes back into the past and steals a prescription he wrote for William Rockwell. Something shady was going on. The prescription notes that transporting such quantities of whatever this was, was highly illegal, and Dr. Gusset smuggled it aboard, evading the inventory locks. Showing him the prescription slip makes him run out of his office, ashamed of whatever part he played in aiding William Rockwell the night of the tragedy. It's gotten to the point where Richard seems to have complete control over when he can leave, often to precisely the perfect moment he requires. Hmm. Skipping over the fun-filled casino segment, Richard hears from a little boy ghost that William stabbed someone he refers to as Mr. Arthur. The plot thickens. I guess. We pretty much know who's behind the tragedy, but not much else. So this is kind of junk information at the moment. In a silly puzzle, we must play a record in the nursery, so the boy's mother will sing along, helping the two reunite. This gives us the film reel that the boy had for some reason, which helps the theater engineer cross over. Playing the film, we watch a short comedy skit that morphs into footage of William stabbing Mr. Arthur and an unnamed woman. Dr. Gusset, who just happened to be hiding out in the theater, is relieved. With the knowledge that it was a cursed dagger that killed everyone aboard, and not the large supply of poison he gave to William, he passes on guilt-free. Wow, okay, sure. Dressed in our stolen suede tailcoat, Richard gains entry to the dining room. Inside, he meets the ghosts of Arthur Rockwell and his wife Hilda. You should have already witnessed the reason we are here. Our father, William, the Red Knife, that is how it all began. Within one generation, father was able to make our family filthy rich. And that was all done after he obtained that red stone knife. Our father was a cold person to begin with. I could see father was slowly converting to evil. Yes, it was as if that red stone possessed him. We were terrified, so we both were planning on killing him on this ship. But our father was thinking the same. He tried to kill us and succeeded because of that knife. So in trying to kill William, they caused him to abandon his poison plan, so he just stabbed everyone, or used demon magic or something. 
Great. Good job, guys. A gun would have worked, too. Looking at a painting, which Arthur says will reveal the history of the curse. As I guess Richard's ability is now common knowledge or something. We find ourselves in a castle in 1496, where we learn the history behind the cursed red gem. Long ago, there was a king. This king rose from his humble origins as a soldier, thanks to a magical red stone. But a mercenary betrayed the king, stealing the stone for himself. This one-eyed mercenary was the Rockwell's ancestor, Alan Rockwell. Things get complicated a bit, since somewhere along the line, the stone was lost. But William recovered it centuries later, revitalizing the family curse. I like that once again, Richard gets caught spying, only to warp back before getting properly shanked. It's a nice little way to show that we are indeed there in the flesh, fully capable of getting gutted as we stand around gawking in the past. Our father, that knife has destroyed this ship. You are like us, just another prisoner of this ship. I have something to ask of you. I want you to find three more plates like this one here. You will need it in order to reach our father. We will stay and wait for you here. Now we have the goal for the end game track down all four plates to open the video game door to get to William. Below deck, we struggle with draining the water from the pool above to complete a puzzle, running into numerous other interlinking puzzles in the process. After helping a maid ghost who thought that she broke a mechanical parrot, we find the shattered plate, sending Richard to a graveyard in 1910. A hunchbacked caretaker tells us to leave, before anything bad happens, going so far as to do a creepy laugh. But we open a secret passage and enter the catacombs beneath the cemetery. There are bloodstains everywhere down here, and soon we find out why, meeting face to face with William Rockwell. He tells us to leave and offers to guide us to the exit. Yeah, it's a trap. We find the body of another one of his victims, and snatch her pendant, before taking a knife to the face. To power the Red Gem's magic, the owner must feed its souls. So this explains the missing people before, and this murder crypt now. Grabbing the plate, we evade William and the gatekeeper, and warp Richard safely back to the Orpheus where we find the once broken plate intact. In the water pump room, we are confronted by a ghost we've seen here and there. Giving her the pendant we found in the crypt, Richard helps another hostile spirit pass on. Now that we have drained the pool under the blood red moon, we finish the only time related puzzle. I don't know why, but the fish eye we slot into the bottom of the pool projects an image of a library, where this bookworm ghost found a book, which he says explains everything. So looking at the projection, we go back in time to steal this book from some annoying librarians. After all the trouble getting it, the book doesn't tell us anything we don't already know. Legend speaks the two stones can change one's destiny. The red stone gave the wielder the power to mold their destiny through sacrifice. The book is less certain on the blue stone, admitting that what it does is unknown, only that it is said to be the opposite of the red stone. A warning is given, never sacrifice too many lives to the red stone, or you will presumably end up possessed like William. The last cryptic bit of trivia is that the two stones never shall meet, for something disastrous will happen. Overall, a pretty useless book, but it did set a new goal for us. 
we need to restore the blue gem and get both of the stones together. What will happen is anyone's guess, but you can't tell me something vague like that and expect me not to test it out. And taking a ride in the kitchen dumbwaiter, Richard is cornered by the ghost of the king. Unable to escape, we struggle to resist the suction magic pulling us towards him. But just as we are about to get grabbed, someone turns on the lights. It's Richard's father. Richard's one-armed father. Huh. I guess that train flashback explained Richard's lifelong question of how his father lost his arm. Either infection from the gunshot, or jumping off that train. I'm no longer the same person I was when I first met that girl. The Red Stone. William, what have I come this far for? Trudging around below deck, we save a few crewmates and solve the telegram puzzle. After spelling out Kreia's name in Morse code, we meet Kreia's brother, who is either wearing a hard hat or has the most unfortunate polygonal bowl cut. Receiving a music box, we are sent to a cathedral in 1912. Playing the tune on the organ opens a secret stairway, a very long stairway. And at the bottom, we find Kreia, imprisoned by her grandfather. Showing her the music box and our half of the blue stone, she recognizes Richard as that man from the train. She regretfully informs us that William stole her half of the blue stone when he imprisoned her. Since meeting Henry, Kreia has spent her life researching the two stones, and according to her research, the blue stone is needed to destroy the red stone. You can't help her escape, but she gives you an earring that helps her brother pass on. Promising to meet again, Richard returns to the present. Back on the Orpheus, Richard continues investigating and helping ghosts, until he finally collects all four plates to open the big Resident Evil door. Not wanting to confront William, Arthur and his wife decide to dip out on you, passing on with words of encouragement. Beyond this door are the Rockwell family suites, and I have to say, they are ugly. Some of the worst room designs I've seen outside of HGTV. But it was 1913, and money can't buy you taste. Inside we meet Arthur's younger siblings, Amelia and Jack. Jack was complicit in his father's atrocities, all to farther the family name and regain their lost wealth. I don't know if he was possessed as well, or if he's just evading responsibility for his actions, but he mentions forgetting how long ago he started helping William, and why. Showing him a picture of Amelia and him as children prompts Jack to remark, yeah, those were the good old days, and he passes on guilt-free. Sure, why not? Fitting that his room looks like you're being burned alive in an oven. On the nose, but fitting. Inside Kreia's room, we find a bright blue, cloudy sky, filling an oddly empty sitting room. Portraits line the walls, the first of which transports us once again to 1496 where we snatch a cameo from the king's body. The other three pictures are of Kreia and her family. Her father was an aviator, as a hot air balloon sits in the background of every family portrait. From the birth of her brother, to a shot of the family bundled up for an afternoon flight, each picture chronicles a happy and idyllic life in the countryside. No trace of William or the family curse in sight. But one thing nags at me. Who are Kreia's parents? The only children of William in the game are Arthur, Jack, and Amelia, none of whom are Kreia's parents, according to the way they talk about her in dialogue. The five suites house William, Arthur and his wife Hilda, Jack, the spinster Amelia, 
and Crea. Well, William kidnaps Crea in 1899, and one portrait, when Crea was four, is labeled 1898. But it isn't likely he killed her parents, looking at the other paintings, as her brother is grown, and the both of them look significantly older than five, judging by their height compared to their father. The most alarming and mysterious piece of this puzzle is the close-up shot of Crea and her father. With his eye patch, he is the spitting image of Alan Rockwell. Evidence points us to conclude that Crea's father may actually be Alan, who achieved some sort of immortality through his use of the red stone. Crea's mother may be the king's daughter Eleanor, but the one portrait where we can see her clearly isn't enough to confirm this. If this is true, we can probably reason that William indeed killed her parents when he kidnapped her. Though I'm not sure how this explains the brother being on the Orpheus in 1913. Leave your thoughts in the comments. I would like to hear other interpretations. Out in the hall, Richard once again comes face to face with the king. Thankfully, we have the cameo of his daughter. Another ghost busted. Inside William's suite, we surprisingly find William. No longer possessed by the red stone, he laments his past actions. Having left William for dead, after finally achieving his vengeance, Richard's father is now possessed by the stone's evil power. Holding up a crystal ball, William shows us Crea's final moments. That's right, she's already dead. In 1913, two months before the Orpheus set sail, Crea was killed by thugs William sent to retrieve the blue stone she had stolen from him. Also, knowing about our time-traveling shenanigans, William begs us to go back in time, save her, completing the blue gem in the process, and ending this wretched curse once and for all. So we warp back to an isolated cabin in the mountains somewhere, and grab the singular bullet from the table, preventing Crea from loading her pistol, and ultimately getting shot by her own gun. Freya takes our reunion with little surprise, simply remarking that Richard is a strange man, appearing at random, out of nowhere. But there isn't time to chat. The knife-wielding thug calmly walks in, and though surprised by Richard's presence, remarks that he could kill the both of us just as easily. The scene plays out as it did before, only with Kreia valiantly telling Richard to run and let her handle this. But just as before, a sudden, everyday mountain earthquake topples the nearby cabinet. Only this time, when the thug picks up Kreia's revolver, it's empty. Exiting the cabin together, Richard and Kreia attempt to escape, but are cut off from the rope bridge by a Tommy gun wielding gangster. Preying upon Kreia's ambiguous yet supposedly reciprocated feelings for Richard, the gangster offers to spare us in exchange for the blue gem. Crea, despite everything she's been through, agrees to save our life. But surprise, the scumbag is lying. He grabs Crea and prepares to shoot us anyway. Now, not to nitpick, but this being 1913, the Thompson machine gun hadn't been invented yet. I would pay money to see someone successfully shoot one full auto with one hand, though. Admirable grip strength. And Crea begs him to leave us out of this, which prompts the gangster to shove her back over to Richard to send us to heaven together. But Crea stands between us and blocks all of the bullets with her body somehow still having the strength to tackle the man, sending them both tumbling down the mountainside to their deaths. But she dropped the blue stone, so Richard pockets that and heads back to the present. Now, I will be the first to say that this scene bothers me. Freya was an amazing woman, 
and while her character arc and romance with Richard and the player isn't particularly well written. It pains me that despite having the power to go back in time at will, Richard just decided to cut his losses and mourn for Kreia immediately. It is memorable, and a romance that was doomed before it even began is tragic and all that, but come on. I suppose this is what all that buildup was for in the first place. The sobering reality that Kreia died when Richard was still a baby. <sighs> anyway. In the present, William is dead, having succumbed to his apparent stabbing. Grabbing the engine room key, we backtrack through the boat for the final confrontation with the Red Stone and Richard's father. <laughs> I finally understand now, Richard. I realized it the moment I killed William and got hold of the Red Stone. I had the strongest desire for this power all along. I will become one with this power. The blue stone, even it shall succumb to my powers in this darkness. There is no light here. Not even you or your blue stone will survive. And after all that, we are chased by the ghost of William Rockwell for some reason. While we attempt to get the engines up and running and the lights back on. If you read the handy wall chart on your way in, this part isn't too bad. Once completed, William disappears, allowing us to bring the blue and red stones together, resulting in them phasing out of existence. So, the downside of all that fiddling we did to get the lights on earlier. Well, as the wall chart also explained, it causes the engines to explode. Oops. So, we have 99 seconds to escape. And once again, for some reason, Richard just leaves his father behind. I mean, there's more than enough time to carry him. But, okay. Sure. I guess he's dead. Now here is where the multiple endings come into play. The back of the case says three, but there are actually four endings. And the first is not making off the boat in time. But there's more than enough time to escape. To get this ending, you practically have to wait the time around. In an FMV, we see the Orpheus being picked up by light rays, presumably transporting the ship and everyone aboard to the afterlife. The night has passed, and a clear blue sea sparkles in the shining sun. A police report records the arson, and the mysterious disappearance of Henry Osmond. It notes that his son Richard Osmond was called in and also disappeared during the investigation. The case remains unsolved. And the second normal ending requires players to make it to the front of the boat. After being saved once again by Kreia, Richard is woken up by Officer Foremast. It appears that he was daydreaming while looking at the clock in his father's room. Finding no evidence, the two leave for the night, with the officer reassuring Richard that his father will probably turn up someday. Common American police procedure. As they prepare to leave, the engine won't turn over, so he asks Richard to get some tools out of the trunk. But there are no tools, only the dagger with its glinting red stone. Oh, foreboding. The third and fourth endings require collecting all 26 astral pieces and handing them over to the blind medium. Besides the casino ghosts, these are all relatively easy to come by in a casual once over of the Orpheus. So you create another red stone and a dagger no less 
which I guess is just naturally created with it. I have to say, 26 soul gems seems awfully cheap for how powerful and dangerous these daggers are. Oh well. Now, when you make it to the front of the ship, the medium speaks to you. Behind a nearby decorative sun, there is a secret passage leading to a room textured to appear, as he said, inside the sun. You have the decision to either take the dagger or leave it. Taking the dagger gives you Ending 3. Kreia still saves you, and much like Ending 2, Richard finds himself back in his father's house. But this time, after talking to Officer Foremast, players lose control of Richard, and he stabs the poor cop with the dagger, the screen fading to black as the red stone glows ominously. Not a terrible ending, a little short, but it's fine for a bad ending. The final true ending requires players turning down the dagger. It is interesting that the medium isn't evil, so much as a Faustian demon, or perhaps the devil himself, who tempts others to do evil. For how flat his character was the entire game, this ending adds quite a bit of depth to him. After being teleported away by Kreia's ghost, we cut to Richard, back in the safety of his own home. This is the waifu ending. As the music box plays, we are shown a montage of every scene of Kreia over the entire game. Not that there were that many. Ending with a flourishing Kreia farewell, with a superimposed FMV model that was only used here and on the Japanese box art. A little cheesy, but it cements how From Software meant us to view her character. Without a doubt, she is the tragic love interest. And that's Echo Knight. Stumbles a little near the end, but pretty good, huh? It does bother me when a mystery leaves loose ends unanswered. Like what was in that broken glass case where the artist was locked up? Or if Kreia's dad was actually Alan Rockwell? But I suppose if everything was cleanly wrapped up, it wouldn't weigh as heavily in your mind after the fact, now would it? An excuse, but a true one. All in all, Echo Knight masterfully uses its time travel device to divvy information out of order chronologically, allowing the player to feel as if they're slowly piecing the story together on their own. Sometimes they knock you over the head with something you already know, just to make sure you're on the right track. But in a game with a predetermined story, with almost zero player control over the narrative, giving just enough that a player can feel like they're reaching conclusions far before they're beaten over the head with the answer, well, it's rewarding, and the mark of good mystery writing. Or bad, depending on how much thinking it took. Depends on the person. Echo Knight is a fresh experience. Sure, it may have been made right after Titanic, but unless you're someone who regularly plays mystery point clicks, we don't get a period piece game set on an ocean liner that often. Normally, modern walking sims aren't really my style. Very rarely, if a game with an engaging enough story comes along, I can immerse myself and forget about the gameplay or graphics. That may be a tall order with the current state of writing practices, however, but that's fine. I can wait. Contemporary Japanese reviews are nearly impossible to find for many of these old games, so relying solely on the Famitsu score. Echo Knight did alright, receiving a 32 out of 40. In the West, since we didn't get the game until July of 99, which was five months after the announcement of the PS2, the critics were abuzz with talk of graphical quality. So most of what they criticized was the low poly count and terrifying graphics. 
that and how short the game is. They said about six to eight hours. Well, it took me a little over four. The game is short, no doubt about that. In a turn, a surprisingly insightful IGN showed that someone at the time understood the genre. With the phenomenally powerful PlayStation 2 on its way, a lot of talk in the industry is centered around gameplay. The concern is that we're going to see an awful lot of all bark and no bite games for the new console, which boasts flashy graphics and amazing special effects, but fail to deliver the essential gameplay that makes the thing fun. There are more than enough examples of this with the current PlayStation. Bet you've bought a few of them too. But Echo Knight will never be placed in this category. Many Western reviewers fail to appreciate this, but the fact is that the No Frills Horror Sound Novel game is immensely popular in Japan, since gamers there tend to look more for atmosphere and storyline. Kama Itachi no Yoru, Knight of the Weasel Slash, on the Super NES, for example, is cited by Japanese gamers, even today, as perhaps the scariest and best horror game ever made. Mediocre graphics may not enchant most people, but the payoff in the case of these games is the sense of immersion and involvement they deliver. And that's just what makes Aconite so great. Players embody the story and are treated to an experience. The atmosphere is infectious, and with how intriguing the game's hook is in the first 10 minutes, players quickly become embroiled in the mystery of the Orpheus. Since this is mainly a story-driven game, and a mystery at that, some of the magic is lost on repeat playthroughs. One strength in this is the fact that due to the nature of getting bits of the larger picture out of sequence, some gamers may actually have an easier time understanding the story the second time around. Now not everyone enjoys walking sims, so Echo Knight may not sound like your cup of tea. But trust me on this, everyone that has played this game, at least those not preoccupied with the graphics, walk away singing its praises. And this truly is an overlooked gem that more people should play. With a short investment time, and being rather easy at that. What's stopping you? Well, it would be nice if it was available on the Western PlayStation Store. That way, we wouldn't have to deal with the retro price gouging. So like most of these games, I guess that's stopping you, isn't it?